black people were told in the past that swimming isn't for us, that our bones are too dense to be in water and these lies. It doesn't mean that we can't change the future to make sure that these issues aren't being repeated down generations and generations. You are the definition, we ban this term around a lot, I feel, game changer, but you are the definition of a game changer in sport. Like, just to kick this off with one of the most amazing things about you is that the Tokyo Olympics, you became the first black woman to compete for Team GB in an Olympic swimming event, which is kind of beyond shocking in a way because it's taken 125 years from swimming's Olympic debut in 1896, we're talking Victorians here, for, to, to make this happen. The racism and the stereotypes surrounding black people in swimming have left black people in a certain place when it comes to getting in the water. And um, I think it was 1980, I believe, was the first time we had a black person for Team GB in swimming in the Olympic Games. And then it's taken like 41 years or 40 years to have a black woman. And I'm really hoping it's not another 40 years to get another person into it. And that's why I'm having these conversations and just trying to let people know that, yes, black people were told in the past that swimming isn't for us, that we should stick to athletics, that we're too dense to, our bones are too dense to be in water and all this, these lies, basically. Whilst we were told that and it has left black people in a certain place, it doesn't mean that we can't change the future and can't influence what we can in the present to make sure that these issues aren't being repeated down generations and generations. Was there a moment when you were like, wow, this isn't really a space for me or a sport that's not necessarily creating a space for me? I'm mixed race. My mum's black and my dad's white. And my mum was the one who took me to ground to competitions and everything. So um, very dryly. It was always really easy to spot her in the audience. Like, I, I didn't have to look too, too, like, look into people's faces too much to spot my mother. I mm. didn't really notice it like that at the same time. Like, upon reflection as an adult, thinking about it, I was like, oh, yeah, there was some, there was some, like, moments where, you know, pe people said things that alluded to my race or to my mum's race or something like that. But at the time we just kind of put ourselves in a bubble. I don't know whether it was intentional or not on my mum's half. She never really spoke about it. She, she actually didn't know the whole black people don't swim thing. Um, she grew up in Ghana, uh, by the sea in Accra, went to the beach, swam in the water all the time. And in her mind, like swimming's just something that you do. It's a life skill. You, you should be able to know how to do it. So when I was about 15 years old, I was like, mum, have you heard this thing that black people don't swim or that we can't swim? And she was like, yeah, I know. And we laughed about it. And um, so I think I was just very fortunate that I never saw race like that. And it always sounds like really flippant. Mm. But at the same time, I think it was really good because if I had been like a nine or 10 year old girl realizing these societal issues which are happening at the time, that is a lot for a child to take on. I think it's a lot for an adult to take on. So I'm really grateful that for whatever reason, I never saw it like that because it could have pushed me out of the sport and I have seen it push people out of the sport. It was only when I got older that I started to have these conversations and through having these conversations, been able to unpack things which had happened when I was younger and start to really process it properly. But asking a 12 year old girl or a, even a 16, 18 year old girl to try and process that, I think is quite unfair on her, especially when she's just trying to be good at a sport. <laughs> and that's kind of where your work with the Black Swimming Association comes in, which you co-founded. And there's kind of no denying that swimming does have a diversity problem because some of these stats are very eye-opening, like 95% of black adults and 80% of black children do not swim. How are you going about overcoming those stats and trying to like turn the dial on that and bring those stats down? So I suppose me personally, whenever I can, I just tell people to go and swim. <laughs> I'm like, I could push it. I'd be like, go get your lessons. Yeah. If you haven't swam in a while, go get some top-up lessons. There's no judgment in it at all. There are people of every age who don't know how to swim and there are lessons for every age to teach you. And um, so that's kind of like my personal 
right, this is what I'm doing. Whenever I have a conversation, I'm going to tell people how to swim or I'm going to tell people to go swim. Uh, but in terms of the BSA, it's um, policy making with uh, aquatic governing bodies, getting into boardroom level com- conversations and just trying to be the bridge between the black and Asian communities and the aquatic sector. And, you know, it's really exciting some of the work we've got going on. We're looking into completely dispelling the bone density myth lies, which have plagued black communities for so long. And it's one of those things that even if it is true that black people's bones are too dense, that we can't float or something like that, you still can learn how to swim. And it shouldn't deter people from getting in the water. It just means that teachers might need to find a different way in order to do that. But even still, I don't think it's true at all. We're mm. also doing some work around the cultural the cultural barriers which stop Black and Asian people from swimming. So whether that's um, the issue of modesty for Asian women in particular or for Black women, hair and managing that in the pool or how far you live from a pool, meaning that like access and then finance and so yeah we're trying to understand the issues which are happening within our communities we know what they are but it's always so helpful to have that like concrete these are the issues we've gone out we found we found the evidence and then we're going to um the boardroom meetings and being able to move things along yeah do you think co-creating the black swimming association has been a real turning point in you discovering the power of your voice Yes, um, definitely. I So I set out talking about this in like 2019 and it was first in, I wrote, I wrote an article for Galden magazine and honestly, I didn't expect anybody to really care. Um, I, I've heard, I just, I don't know, I just didn't. I was, I was like, I'm just, I'm swimming along, I'm doing my own thing and um, I'm going to speak about this. If people care, great. If not, at least I've tried, maybe my story will reach somebody who doesn't know how to swim and it'll encourage them in some way. Mm. So um, when we first created the Black Swimming Association, it was just before Black Lives Matter kind of had its power brought back into it and was back in the mainstream media again. And off the back of that, I think it gave the aquatic sector a real good opportunity to have a look in the mirror and see where they can help people and see that there are people out there trying to move things along and make it more positive for everybody out there. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really fortunate. The, the coverage the BSA has had is amazing and it's, it's only the beginning as well, which I find a little bit terrifying, (laughs) like in a really good way. It's so like personally for me, I want everyone swimming. I want everyone to know how to swim. You don't have to love it, but be able to swim 25 meters. So if you need it one day, I mean, hopefully you don't, but if you need it to save your life, you have that. And that that's my ambition with it. And one thing you're definitely changing and really another thing that you're game changing in is your work on redesigning swimming hats, specifically for Afro hair, because this hasn't really existed before. And that is such an amazing thing that you're doing and such a gift you're giving back to the community, which is so empowering. When do you feel like you would have really needed those swimming hats the most when you were starting out? Partnering with Soul Cat has been absolutely amazing. They um, they just had this passion and idea where they're seeing black women struggle with their hair in the pool and it's made by two black men and they're like, okay, let's just make a bigger swimming cap. And for me, honestly, it... It just, I think just seeing it when I was young, just being able to see it as a child, as like a nine, 10 year old child, I think would have made quite a big difference because you see that there are products out there for braids, for locks, for afros. And I've always changed my hair to fit into a swimming cap. I've been doing that since I was eight years old and I'll be doing it up until I retire. That's just like how I've managed my swimming career. And I started working with Soul Cap in 2020 which means that when I go on holiday, especially when I've got box braids, I can go for a swim and not have to deep it too much that my hair's gonna get wet. So it's just nice that there is that option out there available for people now. But I think especially for young kids who want to be good at swimming and want to, you know, potentially take it to the next level, 
just seeing that the option is there is enough to mm. show them that they can excel in the sport because it, it, you don't even have to have used it. But I think just knowing there are people out there who are looking at these issues. And if you do one day want to have like an Afro out whilst you're swimming, you can go swim and still cover your head and not have to like try and manipulate it into like a tiny little hat. Cause they are small. They are really small. Even for, even for like non Afro Caribbean hair, it's tiny. <laughs> They look tight, those swimming caps. I'd be like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's a facelift. Some of them, it's properly like, and they, some of them give you a headache as well. Like, <laughs> Oh my God. But that's one of the things that was, when I was reading about this, that actually made me want to literally throw my computer out the window as I was reading it, because it made me so frustrated, was that the swimming caps you designed were not allowed at the Olympics on the grounds that they did not fit a natural form of the head. Like when you find that out and you hear that, how much do you think that still underlines the inequalities in sport? It went, it got really far actually. This went really global and had such an amazing response from so many people. And it's just one of those things where it was very ignorant um, on FINA, as now, now World Aquatics, but they were called FINA at the time, on their half of understanding what the hat was for. They didn't see it through the lens of this is just going to be able to allow people if they want to turn up to the olympics with knotless braids or locks that they can still compete and truthfully i won't be turning up to the olympics with knotless braids or locks that is a lot of weight on your head to be dragging through the water and that's fine if that's what you want to do that's fine go for it but it's the fact that I would not, I can't, so in my event, the marathon swim, the rule is you have to start with a swimming cap on your head. And I actually wouldn't have even been able to have like started the race if I had like braids or anything like that, because it wouldn't have fit. I mean, I could have just put it over, but then my braids would have been out. And I wouldn't race like that anyway, That's but that's not really the point. The point is, I wouldn't have had the option. I would have had to have put this cap mm. over my head and swim with like a tail behind me. And it's just the wrong message to be sending to people. We should be showing people, yeah, these caps are available for anyone from any level to swim on because it, it, it's fine. It doesn't matter. It's their choice if they want to. And um, like I was, I was saying earlier, like for little boys or little girls looking up at the top of the sport and seeing that essentially their hair isn't allowed to be expressed as they want it to be at an Olympics or at a world championships. It's just such a shame. It's such a wrong message. Thankfully it was mm. overturned a year later and now it is, it is available to use at the Olympics, at the world championships, which is great. And, you know, we might see people using it and we might not, but it's the fact that we have the option that is important.